Oh, kidok. So I'm going to just do another health update here. Um, somebody asked me how I'm doing. I've been meaning to actually update you guys, but I had an appointment uh, to follow up on my, I had another rectal scope and colonoscopy with three biopsies and I was supposed to have a follow up last week, but I, I think she got tied up in a surgery or something. So it sounds like it's going to be bumped to February 8th. So, but I have enough to update you on with the CT scan uh, and the liver situation. Um, so I figured I'd just talk about that in this one. And basically, so the CT scan um, showed that I do have a very large, I don't remember the measurements, but uh, incisional hernia. So basically my entire midline is a hernia. Uh, so you could kind of say it's diastasis rectus and that the, the muscular wall is separated, but it's beyond that. And I have several loops, they say, of basically intestines that have pushed through the abdominal wall. So it's kind of like just all there you can just see it all so um, I mean it explains a lot because you know I know people don't want to hear about your health all the time when you're um, doing everything mundane every day and I don't even want to hear it actually um, but you know like you eat something anything that ferments sugars carbs and um, when you have a wall to hold that back I don't have that so everything's pretty pretty bloaty to kind of an extreme amount. Um, so I know what I can eat and stuff to kind of keep, and even just gas is a weird thing when you have an ostomy because you have to let the air out of your bag. And um, so it's, especially when you're sleeping, it's troublesome. Um, anyway, so yeah, so you kind of get to be a little bit high maintenance, except for I really try not to be by just kind of bobbing, weaving. Anyway, so that's the incisional hernia part. Um, it, the CT scan also showed, I do actually have a small hernia underneath the stoma, but I don't have a peristomal hernia, which is supposed to be quite complicated. So, I mean, as if it needs to be any more complicated. They do want to use a mesh, uh, a large mesh in my abdominal wall, which has kind of created a whole other um, area for me to explore because they used to use a lot of synthetic meshes but I guess now they're moving into a biologic meshes so they use um, looks like they come from either bovine which is like cow porcine pork um, pig or um, human and when I was even talking about the biologics with my doctor um, which conversation went really well um, she was saying that she didn't think that it came from embryonic sources, like from fetal tissue. Um, but to be honest, I don't really trust that, like, because almost everything that I look at says, like, it'll say human, but then it'll say a propriety blend. So they don't, like, it's like their own undisclosed information. Uh, that makes me just think that I can't even really trust manufacturer information, um, so if it's like a human source, it just makes me very weirded out. Uh, even though like in a sense, if it was from, let's say like, I don't know if they take it from an umbilical cord or something like that, um, I guess they, it would seem like that would be more integrated into our body better just because I am human. Uh, so anyway, yeah, so there's a biological mesh thing that I haven't really gotten to the bottom of that I'm looking into. And then uh, the CT scan also showed that I have um, the esophageal and the gastric varices are still present. So basically at the time of the surgery, and nobody knows why, there was um, a liver injury. So the smallest vessels in my liver, which are the sinusoidal area, is impaired and so the blood flow is uh, slowed and so my body is because it's backed up which was what caused the ascites even though I was able to get that under control um, without like and get off the diuretics um, naturally um, it's still rerouting the blood through my gastric system up into my throat and so those veins, those bloodways have added pressure which they're not built for 
and if they were to burst, then I would ha have internal hemorrhaging. So nobody wants to do a surgery on somebody in that situation because your um, cardiovascular system is put under more pressure in a surgery and it increases the likelihood of hemorrhaging. So they want to, they gave me a length of time and I did um, a lot of green juice and liver diet and things to naturally heal it. Heal it. Um, castor oil topically with DMSO, castor oil packing. Um, I've been doing this stuff for two years basically and the, they're still present. So, and I could keep riding that wave except that now with the complication on my rectum, um, it needs to get dealt with and nobody's going to do the surgery. So the procedure they're looking at is called TIPS and on the Vancouver Island, the only place it's done out of Victoria, so at least where I'm going, there they do a lot of them, and I'm a good candidate because the rest of my liver is um, unremarkable; it's pristine, um, so it should go well. I guess the highest risk is something called encephalopathy, hepatic encephalopathy, and which is basically when. So the TIPS procedure, it's like a bypass where they puncture a hole and they put a bypass, this kind of like a stent that would be used for a um, heart. They put a shunt, it's called a shunt, between the hepatic and the portal venous. Um, so they, and they're gonna start with the most conservative allowance. So they're gonna try to bypass the least amount of blood possible because essentially this blood is gonna be unfiltered because it won't pass through the liver, which I'll explain that in a minute. So basically they wanna do the least amount because if they did the full amount, I would die. So you, you, your body needs to have a liver. Um, it needs, the blood needs to be filtered. So they're gonna do the least amount possible and then they can go back in and they can bump it bigger and in the case that I did develop hepatic encephalopathy, they could at least get me through the surgeries and then they could close it afterward. And I would just have, again, impaired blood flow with chance of, like with the varices and in, in, I guess increased chance of um, hemorrhaging internally. But my varices were always kind of under control. Um, they're not huge. It's not like, like the impairment is like it's not catastrophic or anything um, it's manageable um, anyways so the hepatic encephalopathy is basically the blood flow that is not being filtered uh, it filters out ammonia from your blood your liver filters out ammonia and while they don't say as a matter of fact the thinking is that the ammonia that now is just circulating through your body it crosses the brain blood barrier the blood brain barrier and what's up go for it dress warm no actually because we're leaving soon then minute? two minutes yeah you go ahead um so then it crosses the blood brain barrier quickly what's up yes you don't need to ask that right now okay um so the ammonia gets into your brain and causes you to go delirious. And obviously it's like a spectrum of how intense that could be. And I guess it looks, the, you know, my, my chances of it are like 10, 10 to 30% roughly, but they don't, I don't think they really, nobody really knows. So, um, and there are things, basically ammonia is caused from proteins, like eating protein. Uh, it's the, it's like the, byproduct of eating protein uh, which I do like one of my best foods for bloating and digestive re things and healing uh, after surgeries and stuff is you need protein um, and that's one of my best foods is meat actually so yeah so I've kind of been um, exploring that with my naturopath the shift we'll do is probably going to be moving into more like um, taking protein in the forms of the um, like glycine and proline, um, things that uh, proteins or amino acids, which make up protein, uh, well, they make up peptides, which make up protein, um, the ones that produce less ammonia. Um, and I think vegetable proteins produce less ammonia too, but they're also lower in protein. So that might be, I don't know. Um, 
yeah, I don't know what the correlation is there. And then there's other things that, um, as a byproduct, increase ammonia. Like, I'm trying to remember what they were, but I was reading on them. Arginine, and um, which is really high in dark chocolate, which is like my one piece in the morning. I just really enjoy that, but I'll probably give that up after the um, shunt gets put in. And... Uh, what else is there? There was one other thing. Basically, uh, you want to keep your gut in balance because just an imbalanced gut, I can't remember what the factor was, but when you have imbalance in the bacteria in your gut, it produces more ammonia. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at is we, I've been like approved for that and I'm just waiting for the call and I don't know why things take so long when I have been diagnosed with moderately severe divergence colitis. So even though um, I haven't had the follow up with my GI doctor to like, I guess, confirm diagnosis, she did diagnose me and write it on my, like my paperwork that I got sent home with. And she does believe that the inflammation in my rectum is divergence colitis and it's not Crohn's related. So it's because my rectum misses my colon and then um, the other thing was she said that, oh, I have a like irritation on the stoma, on the front of my stoma, the face of my stoma, and she doesn't think it's anything but just irritation, which of all the things I check out, it was kind of funny that I didn't check out the lubricating deodorant I put in the bag because um, it has weird stuff in it. So it could be that, and it would make sense that it's that, except that I have been using that um, for a long time and it never caused this before, but... Um, you know, sometimes it just can only take a beating for so long. So the surface of it, my stoma is irritated. I've just been using, by her recommendation, a little bit of hydrocortisone but on it, but it, I don't even think it's really helping, and it doesn't bother me, so it's not really even a big deal. Um, the colon itself, she just said, was unremarkable and looked very good, so... It looks like, you know, I'm still like in uh, remission is what they would say with the Crohn's. So that's fine. And I actually like, I overall feel well. And as long as I can keep the rectal inflammation kind of at bay, um, it takes a little bit of elbow grease to keep it there. But I, as long as it's not in that snowballing thing that kind of happened to me, uh, I'm doing okay. Like I'm doing pretty good. Like it gets sore, of course. I'm, you know, trying to not strain and cause kind of prolapse or hemorrhoid and all that kind of thing. But really, I'm just treating it with um, some homemade suppositories. And they uh, wrote me a prescription for short chain fatty acids. Actually, it's not even it's not even a drug. It's a byproduct of what when you eat what your food creates in your colon is short chain fatty acids like butyrate. I was already putting butyrate in my suppositories. So this one has, you know, two other um, short chain, short chain fatty acids in it. So I think it's just a bit more complex and a bit more helpful. So basically, you know, I do one or two enemas a day and offset it with my suppositories in between and, and I'm managing okay. And I sit on hot pads when I'm sitting and um, I still just kind of like put my binder on and keep my stomach pressed in and um, yeah and so we'll get this shunt put in kind of try to help mitigate and avoid encephalopathy and then I will have surgery and it'll either be in a one or two step I would think like attaching the colon um, letting that settle and then rebuilding the abdominal wall so that's kind of where things are at. And um, I'm doing fine. I'm happy. All's well. Hope you guys are good. And love ya. Bye.